community engagement at JTS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session of our summer series of Wandering People, Jewish Journeys, Real and Imagined. Um, special welcome to anyone joining us for the first time today. We have a, an unusual and different and um, exciting session today. Um, the title is Finding Ihar, a scholar's quest to uncover the history of her Jewish community through the journey of its books. Um, the session is going to be uh, fascinating, I already know, but um, I, we're, it's just a special treat for us today to have not only um, a wonderful JTS uh, scholar and teacher, Dr. Marjorie Lehman, a professor of Talmud and Rabbinics, but also uh, Dr. Lucia Conte Aguilar, who is adjunct lecturer in the Humanities Department I'm going to mess it up, I know. Universitat Pompeu Fabra. I'm sorry about that. You'll say it correctly. Um, anyway, so it's, we don't normally have um, scholars, uh, esteemed scholars from other universities visiting us in dialogue with our own uh, scholars in this series. So it's a special treat today. And we're so pleased uh, that both of you are joining us today. Um, we're going to, oh, I should say also, um, if you are uh, feeling inspired by this wonderful opportunity to learn with JHS's Outstanding Scholars. We invite you to consider um, partnering with us by sponsoring a learning session. We have two sponsorship levels, Chacham for $540 and Sadiq for $1,000. And you can learn more by contacting learninglives at jtsa.edu. And thanks for considering that and for um, all the donations that many of you have already made, which have uh, really made the series possible. Um, we're going to do Q&A a, um, a little bit differently today or slightly different structure today. Um, so our two scholars are going to present up front uh, for an extended period and then they will be in dialogue um, with each other for a little while. And then around the hour mark, we will turn to Q&A. Um, and as usual, uh, you can submit questions to me via the chat and I will select from um, among those to share with our scholars. If you have a technical or logistical question, you can um, address that via the chat with Tani schwartz Herman or Lynn Feynman, our JTS staff supporting us um, in this program. You should have received the sources in the same um, email where you got the Zoom link and they'll be screen shared as well. Uh, oh, okay, yes, we'll be, we'll be screen sharing a PowerPoint presentation today. Um, sorry. I've, correct myself, uh, select, and then selections from the PowerPoint um, will be available um, following today's session upon request. So a little bit differently from usual. All right, on that note, I would like to invite Tani schwartz Herman to introduce our two scholars. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, so as, um, as Rabbi Andelman noted, uh, today's session will be co-led by Dr. Marjorie Lehman and Dr. Lucia Conte. Um, Dr. Lehman is professor of Talmud and Rabbinics at JTS. She teaches a wide range of courses in rabbinics, including courses on gender and Talmudic literature, Agada, Halakha, the history of the Jewish book, and pedagogy. Dr. Lehman has written and edited several books as co-director of an internationally renowned digital humanities project in Jewish studies called Footprints, Jewish Books in Time and Place. Dr. Lehman has dedicated herself to tracking and analyzing the global movement of copies of Jewish books since the inception of print. Uh, we'll hear more about this project during our session today. Dr. Lucia Conte uh, teaches courses on medieval history, Jewish history of Spain, and Jewish heritage recovery at the University Pompeu Fabra. She conducted research abroad at the Jewish Theological Seminary uh, where she, connect, she connected with Dr. Lehman. I'm pleased now to uh, turn it over to um, our, our professors to to begin the session today. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to just start my share and make sure that Tani, can you see my share? Can you see it? Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody, and um, welcome to um, our um, session 
Um, I am so glad that you could all be here. I wanted just a few um, notes of thanks as I begin. Um, and uh, before I introduce my wonderful friend and colleague, um, Lucia Conte, um, I just wanna thank JTS, Tani, Lynn, Julia for all the work they do in advance of this. It takes a lot, a lot of background work and um, especially over COVID and it's just been really, really amazing. And I wanna thank you for enabling um, Lucy and I to um, get together and do this, which we would not have been able to do without Zoom and without um, your willingness to link us um, on this day. I wanna also thank David Kramer, who was kind of the inspiration behind this idea. Um, and um, he's the head of the library. Um, and Lucy and I met actually um, as the library was closing down for renovation. Um, we were looking at um, books together in the rare book room right before the books were shipped off. And now here we are again together as the books are coming right back into the library and our rare book room is just about to open to the public. Um, so it's quite exciting. Um, I wanna welcome also um, Luis Carlos, who's the mayor of the town where Lucia is from, Ijar, as well as Jose Angel, who is the um, president of local research in, who is the president of the local research center in Ijar, who I've actually met personally in Toledo, and also the counselor for the heritage of Aragon, Marie Sancho. Um, we wanna also welcome our family and friends and, and all of you to this um, talk today. So I wanna begin with the meeting of Lucia and I. Um, we, Lucia had come to JTS um, to um, study um, and to study copies of a Jewish book called the Tor. And um, she was most interested in the Tor because it was printed in her hometown of Ijar. And she had come to JTS because copies of that 1486 um, tour happened to be at JTS. She was in America at the time, tracking all copies of the tour that had come off the press in Ijar um, before the Jews were expelled from Spain. And, um, and so we met under those circumstances. I would just wanna mention um, before we begin, and I want you to really focus in on this, that the tour is a book also known as Arba Turim because of its four divisions. It's a legal code of Jewish law. It was pieced together originally by Yaakov Ben Asher. Um, he came from Cologne, but Spain of course claims him as theirs because he moved to Spain. And in um, Toledo, he actually um, worked to piece together this magnum opus, the tour, um, which is a seminal work of Jewish law. And um, it, he originally it is in manuscript because he pieces it together sometime between 12 something and he dies in, in um, he dies in 1343. Um, and so um, it then is committed to print um, in the 1400s, in the late 1400s um, in Ijar. Um, so it's a major um, work and I want you to just sort of keep in the back of your minds why it is that that particular book is going to be printed in Ichar as opposed to other books that you know well, Talmud, Siduri, Machzors. So we want to, we just want you to keep that in mind. So Lucia and I, we meet in, um, uh, at JTS. Um, and we start to um, um, talk to one another about our, our common interests. And it turns out that when we met, we were both dreaming. She was dreaming of her own project, one that was gonna restore to the town of Ichar this wonderful Jewish and deep history, deep Jewish history of the role that Ichar played in the Jewish narrative. Um, and she was at that moment, just in the beginning steps of that project. And she's gonna tell you more about that project. And I was at the beginning stages of a project called Footprints, which as Tani mentioned, tracks um, Jewish books, um, copies of Jewish books across the globe. Um, and so we'll get back to that in a minute. We can, uh, we can now say several years later that in fact, our dreams have come to fruition um, and we're gonna share that, um, of course, with you. So here is our PowerPoint. Um, I just wanna make a momentary, um, give you a, a momentary journey. Um, Lucy and I met, and when she was at JTS, 
we actually went to Sother Sotheby's together. Um, Sotheby's was having a Jewish au uh, an auction of Jewish books. This was the auction in which the Bomber Talmud for $9 million was sold to Leon Black, among other things. Um, she then invited me to Spain. You can see on the left-hand side, I'm hoping you're seeing of your screen. She invited me to Spain to Ichar. That is me in Ichar. I thought, oh, this is this little town in the middle of nowhere. Little did I know how important it is for Jewish history. Um, and so we had a conference there. Um, the person sitting to my right is um, Javier Del Barco, who in fact became a person who was very important to our project, um, uh, very important to our project Footprints. I met him uh, through Lucia. Um, and then we together presented on our work at the World Congress in Jerusalem in 2017. So we have, we have connected despite the distance of time and space, we've connected um, around our projects. Um, okay, so with that, um, I really wanna turn over this discussion to Lucia because she is going to situate you in the town of Ichar and she is gonna give you some of the background about her own journey um, before she got to JTS. Thank you, Marjorie, for, for this introduction. And let me thank the JTS for this invitation. It is an honor and very moving for me to be back at JTS, even if it's only virtually for now, um, because my journey somehow started at JTS and who knows, maybe it will end at JTS too. At least this is a spot uh, in this journey. Uh, as Marjorie said, I am from Ija. My family is from there. It's a small, tiny town in the middle of nowhere in Spain, in the kingdom of Aragon. And um, I had learned from a very, very early age that it had had an important Jewish past. This was something like known, everybody acknowledged that, but nobody really knew that much about it. As an anecdote, I can say that we had nicknamed rabbis. So that's the nickname that people from Ikhar has and other people in the area call us rabbis as a nickname. I thought that was intriguing. Uh, we also knew that there was a synagogue or there have been a synagogue there and that, it, that Ikhar was the home of the early print. So as a medieval scholar who started my, I started my research on gender issues and private life as a medievalist. I have not uh, originally an interest in Jewish studies, but this connection with my uh, hometown roots made me shift progressively to uh, the study of Jewish culture. Probably this was not just an academic shift, it had to do with a personal, uh, a deep personal journey as well. So there are many journeys who, which are intersecting today in this presentation because I started to be more curious about the history of Hebrew book, about, wh about why in this small remote, if you want, place in Spain, Jews had a st a started the art of printing in Spain. I was also very determined to restore and, and rescue the synagogue. I will tell you more about that, but it was at risk. So when I did my first uh, steps in New York in, at JTS, I also wanted to claim and draw attention to the fact that there was a synagogue about to collapse, even if at that time we didn't know it was a synagogue. We just had the intuition. But again, I'll tell you more about this later. So all these things converge, converge in an itinerary that focused on the study of Hebrew books and also on my own personal path as a person born and raised in a Catholic family that today is Jewish. I am a Jew because I did a formal conversion. I think that this academic, intellectual, and even professional itinerary had a reflection on my own awakeness of my own soul. Probably it's the other way around. It was my personal awakeness who pushed me to uh, devote more time, more efforts, and more energy to, do, to, to these uh, studies. But this is how I became involved 
in this project, uh, Marjorie. Thanks for the opportunity to share that because now I can proudly say that this project has really become a passion and has changed my life to, to, to the best extent. Then why, why is Ihar so uh, relevant for the history of Jewish people, for the history of Hispanic Jewish culture? Probably most of you do not know this place or have not heard about this place because Ihar is clearly not a mainstream location uh, on, on Jewish Spain. It's not Cordoba, it's not Toledo, it's not one of these, uh, Girona, no, it's not one of these world famous uh, centers of Jewish culture that, that, that we know in, a, in a Spain before the expulsion of the Jews. However, I guess it's time for less mainstream locations to, um, to, to really do research, to really uncover and earth their contribution to Jewish culture, because we are the people of the book. And the books in Spain, the Hebrew books in Spain, mean Ihar. I can uh, maybe uh, show you in this map. Now you see this map uh, on, on the screen. Uh, shows where Ihar is located, more or less. It is a map that shows the, third, the three Hebrew uh, printing presses established in what is today Spain. The first one in, in Guadalajara, established by famous Shlomo Alcabez, the grandfather of the author of the Lejado D. Then Zamora, but the second one is in Ihar. Ihar is more or less in the center of the Kingdom of Aragon. It is a, a small place close to Zaragoza. Uh, it is well connected to the main routes. If you want, it also was well connected to the medieval and modern main routes, but it's not a prominent location. And I think it, it can be important to understand why uh, a printing press was established there. The, the thing is that Eliezer Ben Abraham Alan Tansi, the hero of today's session, moved to Ihar, gathered a team of people, and organized an incredible business there. They were the adventurous people, the pioneers of the so-called Ars Nova, the art of printing. And they developed an incredible workshop there that produced most of the, some of the probably most beautiful uh, examples of Sephardic Hebrew printing ever. And I, I say that with my soul because it is my personal legacy or my local legacy, but also uh, I think uh, the, uh, and the saying that the JTS is uh, completely legal <laughs> because JTS has uh, at least four copies uh, that came from these presses. My apologies on the, um, I didn't, um, a little technical difficulty, but um, I wasn't um, advancing the, the, I'm supposed to be advancing the slides, <laughs> so I apologize. And so just to um, go back one, um, I just wanna make sure this is, this is the, um, what the synagogue that um, looked like. Um, and they had a hunch that this was a synagogue, but it essentially just looked like this. Um, and so I just wanted to essentially show you, show you that, as well as the fact that, um, Lucia, I was hoping that you could just comment on um, the courtyard. Um, sure. On the right-hand side of your screen, you should see the courtyard. That was supposedly the Jewish quarter. Um, and so if you could just comment on the amount of houses that are around it, that would be yes. great. Yes, yes, yes. That's a nice aerial view of uh, the former Jewish quarter of Ihar. Today it's called neighborhood of San Anton because of course after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, um, Jews either left or were forced to convert or converted really, who knows? <laughs> Depends on the personal story of each one. And the neighborhood becomes a new Christian's neighborhood. The, 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 the whole Jewish quarter is organized around this open square, which is huge for the Spanish medieval standards. Um, we think that maybe an excavation, an archaeological excavation of the square might show something else, like maybe there was another line of houses. It's more common that 
there would be like three streets rather than such a big courtyard. But in any case, the location of this uh, neighborhood is somehow apart. It is put on an outcrop on a kind of hill next the site, the rest of the town. It's under the church next to the, the, the town parish, the church, and the castle of the Duke of Bihar. That's important because the landlord of Bihar plays probably a, a role in this story. Uh, in the top uh, corner of the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a building that's bigger than the other ones. That's the synagogue that Alan Dassi and his team attended. And on the left, image, on um, the image on the left side, you can see a view of Bihar um, where, with the Jewish quarter in the first term. Interestingly, um, today there are 43 houses. So this is where it's formed, by, it's closed by 43 houses. And the medieval, uh, in the census from the 15th century reports that the Jewish community of Bihar was formed by around 150 individuals organized in 40 households. So it is cool because it is like the, the, the neighborhood today, it's probably exactly how it would look back then, right? With 40 houses and a synagogue. Uh, this, uh, po the population, uh, the Jewish population of Bihar, it's uncertain when they established there, but it's probably around the 14th, 13th century, most likely. I'll show you later, but the excavations in the Sinao have shown evidence of 13th century walls. In any case, at the beginning of the 15th century, the community was very consolidated. Uh, we had that synagogue that it was already old. There is a document for, from 1410 saying that the synagogue needed preparation because it was already old. So uh, it's probably a very old community, but most of what we know is from the 15th century when uh, the printing press was established, which is like the golden age of the had Jewish work. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to introduce you a little bit more to the printer. This famous man, Eliezer ben Avraham Alantansi, his um, main activity is between 1485 and 1491. You can see just before the expulsion, the printing press closes. Um, we think that has something to do with the fact that the, um, um, I guess it's the governor or the duke, is it Lucia, who um, yes. dies. And we think that he's protecting this printing press. Um, but Alantanzi, interestingly enough, his father is um, skinned alive by the inquisitors based on him trying to um, enable a convert to Christianity to come back to Judaism. And for whatever reason, Alantanzi is sent to Ichar. And the reason why he's sent to Ichar is so that he will not become Christian, meaning that he himself will remain Jewish and the ways in which he will remain Jewish has to do with studying Jewish texts. And so he is sent to some sort of academy or house of study that's located in Ichar. Um, and he there gets his Jewish education and remains there and then eventually opens up this um, printing press. He's a very well-connected character, connected to the likes of um, Don Yitzchak Abarbanel. Um, and he is known um, for a very famous printer's mark, um, which anytime you see it in a book, you know that he had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I'm gonna. And here you can see the mark on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. There's a lion in there with a red shield. Um, Lucia, did you wanna just tell us something about the, the shield? Yes, that, that is the first known printer's mark in the history of Hebrew books. So uh, at least uh, in this, in this uh, Alan Tansi was also a, a pioneer because he was the first who thinks about having a mark to, um, to, to, to mark his, his, his works. It appears for the first time in the Turer Haim uh, printed in the month of Elul of 1485. So it's the first book we know for certain that issued from his presses. 
And as Marjorie said, it appears in other copies and in other editions with or without the shield, but the lion is always there. Later, I tell, I'll tell you about the legacy of this printing press and we can go back to the lion. You can um, see in scholophones also the, um, the, these poems at the end of the book that uh, give us so much information, uh, not only about publishing details of the books, but also sometimes about the team who work at the printing press themselves, who brought uh, um, their experiences or their, their motivations in the colophons. Um, so basically a colophon appears, um, you can see it here right above the shield. It appears at the end usually of a book um, and it's typically has the printer's emblem and usually the printer gives us some information as Lucia said about his team, sometimes some poems, sometimes invokes God. Um, but if you're asking where we get this, a lot of our evidence from, reading colophons is a really important piece of historical evidence. Um, and so you can see that here. Um, we wanna now just refer you a little bit to, no one works alone in a printing house. It's a very complicated process. If you go on Google, you can pull up, you know, um, and you can see, you know, the ways in which printing worked. Um, it was very complicated um, and required a team of people, including um, a financier, who was Solomon ben Maimon Zalmati, and also others, some of whom were not Jews. And so the printing house becomes a place very often where Jews and non-Jews meet together and develop relationships with one another that they can't have outside the printing press. But in addition to this, this particular printing press has a very interesting figure that we want you to think about. His name is Alfonso Ferdinand der Carbo, der, sorry, Alfonso Ferdinand, Ferdinand, Ferdinand <laughs> de Cordoba. Um, and he um, happens to be a converso who leaves Valencia because life is terrible for him in Valencia. He can't live there as a Jew. He converts to Christianity. He arrives in Ijar and he is participating in the team of printing. Um, and so Lucia is just going to tell us a little bit about him because there's something interesting, an interesting question we want you to think about. <laughs> yes, uh, Fernandez de Cordoba, um, as you say, it, it was, he was a silversmith from Valencia who had worked already in the art of printing in Valencia. Uh, we, we, he's known as master printer, maestro de imprentar, according to the documents. He's a very fa famous character in a sense. It, it's well researched. And he was the one who carved the wonderful borders that decorate this books with, that depict lions, dragons, unicorns, dogs, deers, and very incise, delicate flowers and geometric patterns that are and if like- if you look at the top right-hand side of the slide, you can see it. Exactly. These are the ones. And these, these the decorative borders and the initials, the capital letters, like the sheen you see there, these are the um, like another way to identify Ihar uh, printing press, the books that I have issued from there. Then this man was a convert to Christianity. It's not been 100% proven academically, but it seems very pertinent to think uh, that that's true because uh, he escaped from Valencia in 1478 because he has had been condemned to death for a case of heresy. That's what the documentation available say. And of course, what kind of heresy could be of, uh, of interest for the Inquisition in Valencia uh, on the eve of the eve of the expulsion of the Jews, other than Judaizing, than keeping Judaism after being um, converted. It's a very interesting- I just wanna clarify that the Inquisition, just so you know, that prior to 1492 and even after 1492, when the Inquisition goes after people, they are looking not so much for Jews openly practicing Judaism, they're looking for Jews who converted to Christianity who are still practicing Judaism. So that becomes a red flag for the Inquisition, um, for inquisitors. Actually, that is the, the, the jurisdiction of the Inquisition is converted people, as you say, new Christians, or those who interact with new Christians eventually. There is a rare case, which is Alantar's father, 
Alantansi's father, Abraham Alantansi, was also condemned to death by the Inquisition and actually burned at the stake. He was uh, because being a Jew, he had participated in the circumcision of a new Christian. So he was, he could not escape to the inquisitorial repression, but uh, unusually because he was yet a Jew, he was not a Christian. See. But I think that the real question, Lucia, that you and I have been discussing in our, um, in our work is how could it be that the um, um, authorities um, would allow someone to, um, who had converted to Christianity, knowing what the Inquisition was all about and what could happen to him, how could he be allowed um, to print Hebrew books? He was a main player in the production of these beautiful books that came from Ichar, how could it be that this printing press went on for the amount of years that it did, produced the amount of books that it did, and harbored this man who essentially was, I mean, converso. So something doesn't make sense here. Um, and that's something that we really wanna get underneath. Like the, it just like, it, it kind of works against our natural tendency of the way we think of what would be allowed for Jews to do um, um, if they were living in Ichar. So maybe you could just yeah. comment on that quickly. And I, I think that there might be a number of reasons uh, to, to understand that. One, in the particular case of Ichar, they would be allowed probably because of the protection of the Duke, of the landlord. I, I mentioned at the beginning that it's an important character because it seems proven that he protected the Jewish community and might even have been um, involved in the opening of the printing press. So that's an exceptional situation, but it's worth mentioning. But in general terms, the production of Hebrew books, one may assume that most of these books are um, aimed as a Jew at, at the Jewish market to be used by Jewish communities, but not necessarily only because there are Christian Hebrews, for example, who need to read Hebrew texts. Um, uh, if these inquisitors who would censor Hebrew books will need to have a Talmud to censor it, would need to uh, study these texts. Uh, besides that, it's just probably a very good business. It was the business of the time. It, it made access to literacy and to written culture very accessible, very cheap. And even if the market were only the Jewish communities, that's enough. There are some studies about the libraries of Jews in the Kingdom of Aragon back then. And you see that the libraries are normally 10 times bigger on average than a Christian library of a person having the same job and, um, and, and, and standard of life, right? So there were a lot of people who consumed this uh, literary production. There were Talmudic groups uh, studying in the area close to Ihar too. So yeah, probably there are many, many reasons for, for this activity to continue. But as I said, in Iha, the protection of the Duke was very relevant because probably it's not incidental that when the Duke of Iha died in 1491, we don't see any more uh, Hebrew book issued from Iha Press. So the, the, the Hebrew Press is dismantled. Um, we can't actually talk about the history of print at all without talking about the Jews, because the Jews are right there, front and center, involved in the um, creation of, um, of, of, of print. Um, and so, as Lucia said, um, you can, they bought books. And so it was great, great business. Um, and, um, and so in, for those reasons, in many cases, they allowed these presses to, um, to print and continue to print. Um, what we wanted to show you here, we wanted to show you what some of the books, when you're trying to um, write the history of a particular community and of a particular, of a particular community, you want to know what came off the press. What was it that they produced? And so by, by reading into what kinds of books came off the press, you get a sense of what the community was like. Um, so here we wanted to show you that here is just three examples of books that were printed in Ichar um, between 1486 
um, and 1491, and the middle one is held now at JTS. These are Bibles. Um, you can see how, how beautiful they are. Um, and they probably had a market that was not only the Jewish market, but may have even had a market, as Lucia said, um, beyond Jews, because Christians also read Bibles and were interested in um, the Hebrew Bible. Um, and so these may have actually um, um, had a greater market. Um, synagogue, a synagogue might have wanted one or owned one or more. Um, but anyway, um, and we want you to see and compare that to okay, this. Um, mm -hmm. This is the tour that was at that, that Lucy and I met over. This is the tour we were looking at at the JTS library. Okay, you can see the difference here. It doesn't look like those other three that we just showed you, right? This one is plain and this is the title page. It's actually not the title page. It's actually a fly leaf. It's an extra page on the front. And this is actually handwriting. There's handwriting here on the front, um, but the book is actually a printed book. Okay, so but we wanted to just point out that the tour is not illuminated, it's not decorated, it's not as beautiful looking as the Bibles. Okay, so just sort of keep that, keep that in mind. These uh, ornamental borders appear only on, on, the, on the Pentateuchs and the Hebrew Bibles. The first time they appear is in the, in the Shirata Yam, the portion of the passing of the Red Sea, as you see in the slide, but never, never in the Alachic books. The, halach the halachic, the legal books are not illuminated. They're not decorated, um, but we, we know they were studied. Um, they were studied. Okay, so now we just want to transition you to think about the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. So we all know that story and we know that Jews were then moved everywhere. Okay, so you can see by our arrows here, um, many Jews went into Portugal only to then meet a bad end, which was they were forcibly converted in 1497. We know that Jews then went into North Africa. We know that Jews then went obviously moved toward Europe. Um, they moved to Greece. Um, um, and so we know that Jews kind of followed um, a course um, eventually, and we'll get there where America becomes, you know, a central place. The largest amount of book collecting now is done in the United States and in Israel. Um, and so, but there are remnants everywhere. Um, so we wanted you to just see the map of that. Um, and now Lucia is going to talk about those specifically Alantansi's legacy. So Jews as people, they leave Spain and they go everywhere and they take their books with them. But next slide, Lucia, go for it. It's like the printers from Ijar did also leave and did their own diaspora. They also had their own itinerary. The itinerary of the people and or the itinerary of the printing materials. So the legacy of that workshop that was active for around six years and use all these um, amazing initial letters and borders and, and, and different um, face types. In 1485, then in 1491, so just a few months after Icar's workshop is dismantled, another Rabbi Eliezer established the first printing press in Portugal in the city of Lisbon. Interestingly, this person called also Rabbi Eliezer publishes the Pentateuch with the Rashi comments using the same ornamental borders as in Icar and several examples of the dream too. So essentially the same titles, later on they, they publish more because it was very productive, but use the same material and uses the same titles and he had the same name. There is a lot of mystery around that. It was he the same printer living Spain to Portugal because escaping of the bad conditions that the Jews were starting to have in the eighth, eighth eighth of the expulsion, or was it another person? Most scholars say that it's another person and he just sold him the materials, but uh, Nathan Adler uh, went as, uh, as far as to say that he's probably the same man. When 
Lisbon workshop is dismantled. And I invite you to, to check how these materials are the, sa are the same because the, the GPS library also uh, has in custody Lisbon uh, incunabula printed with the material. Well, when this workshop is dismantled, we see that different uh, people who had worked at a Lisbon printing press as apprentices or, or collaborators left Portugal because it's the itinerary of expulsion after expulsion. They left Portugal in 1491, I 97, sorry, when the Jews were forced to convert or leave uh, the Portuguese lands. And we find uh, Samuel Ben Isaac Negibot, who had worked in Lisbon and opened the first printing shop in Africa. First printing workshop in Africa is a Jewish one in the city of Fez, Morocco, using part of these materials. David Ben Shlomo Yaya found his way to the Ottoman Empire, to Istanbul, the capital of the world at the time, working with the Nahmias brothers, printed a Pentateuch with Rashi comments in 1505, using the same ornamental borders as the Iharwan. Yudaged Aliya, established his workshop in Salonika, also Ottoman Empire at the time, using the same materials and starting a, 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 a true lineage of Hebrew printers in the city of Salonika. So in short, these types and, and fonts and face types you see me had played somehow a role no? in the expansion of early Hebrew printing through the Sephardic Mediterranean, but also in this um, process of transmitting this culture, these titles, this need of, of legal literature uh, to, to, for these communities who are in the exile, they, they need to have their, their, uh, their rules, their regulations and their tradition to, to start anew once more, once more, one uh, time after the other, right? So they don't just take their books, they take their press. Exactly. Which is, I mean, you really have to think about this because that means that they're carrying every single letter, right? And all of the typefaces that they would print, you know, is hand press. So they carried all of that with them. And then we have actually records. So a new book could be printed, let's say in Salonika several years later, but it had the same fonts, the same typefaces as Alantansi and therefore Ichar and the memory of Ichar is still with the Jews. Um, as they print new books. So it's not that they just take the books themselves. They actually move the printing press. They start a new printing press. And you can actually trace the history of the Jewish community throughout Europe just by virtue of the opening and closing of printing presses. Um, and so when you tell me, oh, here's a book that was printed in Krakow, I can tell you, oh, it's definitely the end of the 1500s because that's when Krakow was a big center of print. Um, so, but anyway, so, um, okay, next slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we wanna just take you back in addition to the fact that the Jews will leave Spain and they leave with their, um, all of the materials, they also do leave with their individual books with the book copies and each book copy has its own history. I'm sure you can all think about your own libraries. You can pull a book off the shelf you open it up and it has a signature from your grandfather, um, you know, honoring you, um, you know, the birth of your first child and gave you this book and you hold on to it because it has some legacy, some connection to it. Well, like that, we open up individual book copies and we see in those book copies, even though they're printed, handwriting everywhere. So we will see on title pages, handwritten signatures, inscriptions, stamps from libraries. Um, and we can then tell what happened to an individual book copy. And we can then get histories, not of the community of Ichar, but of individuals, persons who took those books and left and settled somewhere else. And the project that I am working on, which is called Footprints, um, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute, can record all of this information. So what Lucy and I wanted you to do is we wanted you to see that this 
volume of the tour, which started, so it comes off the press in Ikhar before the expulsion, and some individual brings it to the market in Almazan. And somebody we think by the name of Suleiman HaKohen, whose name is in the book, lists all the other books that he buys from that market. And this is the list of all the books that he bought. And also there's a date. And according to Lucia, the date is from several days before the expulsion. So right before the expulsion, this man, Solomon HaKohen, he purchases a group of books, including this one. Then he's expelled from Spain. And the next time we know anything about this book, um, it appears in, sorry, it appears in Mantua in Italy, okay? But before I get to that, I'm going back for a second because I want um, you to see the list on the right-hand side. You can see the list of books that, um, that he bought, okay. Um, here, this is our Footprints project. Um, Footprints, as I said, can record all of the details of what happened to a book. It's every encounter of one book copy. Um, and we bring, we get those details from all of those handwritten signatures, inscriptions, and stamps that are found in a book. So you can see here, and you can go to this site if you want, or you can even ask us and load in information that you have of your own books. Um, and on the right hand side here, you have the history of the list of everything that happened to this one book that Lucy and I were looking at at the JTS library. Um, and so the project is called, sorry, the project is called Footprints and the database is open to you to either load in information and look at the information. Um, but, but what we wanna do now is I want Lucia to tell you there is a signature in this copy of the yes. tour. And the signature is of Domenico Gerasolimitano. Yes. And she's gonna tell you now Who's what that? that means. So again, this signature is located in the tour. Okay, so go for it. It's located in the tour and it goes with the date, uh, 1597. So it's an excellent footprint because it gives us a person and a date all in one. And it turns that Sometimes these footprints are kind of anonymous, but that person was a very well-known person. So when, when the footprint, re footprint refers to a well-known person, we can contrast with other sources and that helps in tracing the itinerary of the book. Domenico, was, Gero can you tell us who he was? Yes, Domenico Gero Salimitano was uh, the, uh, a, a converted, a neo Christian, so of a Jewish origin, who um, acted as an inquisitor and was an specialist in the expurgation of uh, Jewish books. He is also the author of the Sefer Asikuk in Latin Index Expurgatorius, where he gives the instructions to other inquisitors on how to censor Hebrew books and how to expurgate them. And he himself with his hands forged at least this copy issued from Ihar uh, Press, um, where he essentially um, crossed out individual words, sometimes long phrases and entire paragraphs, particularly in the passages relating to the laws of idolatry it's pretty common because it's one of the conflict points with Christianity that uh, the idolatry is clearly kind of a friction point. Uh, so we know that this person was active in his work, uh, to name it mildly. He was active in Mantua, Mantua, Italy, between 1578 and 1618. So we can say that's very probable, very likely, that this city was one of the milestones on the way of the tour um, in his itinerary from Ihar first, from the market in Soria, in Castile, that, that, uh, where, where, where he was uh, bought by Shulemana Cohen, and now he goes to Italy, to the region of Mantova, where we have this group of inquisitors. 
Right. So his his signature basically tells us that the book was in was in Mantua. Um, you can also see here, and I hope you can see this slide, but there's a name here on the left hand side. It's actually in um, Roman character. Um, it actually is says Isepo Navar. Um, and then in Hebrew, we think this here on the on the right hand side is in Hebrew, you can see Ish Navar there if you can make it out. Um, and so the research shows that he was actually lived after in the 17th century um, in Italy. And so we know that the book remains in Italy through the 17th century. We have the name of this individual who we never would have known. He's not famous, he's just some guy, um, but he owned and he, he held on to this book. Um, and then we know that um, it eventually arrives in Philadelphia somehow. And I am assuming that the person, um, we know that the person who actually bought it or collected it is Mayor Sulzberger. Now, Mayor Sulzberger is a famous hero. If you're in, you know, JTS <laughs> library, you know, lore, or well, I should say JTS narrative stories, Mayor Sulzberger plays a major role in building the collection at JTS. He immigrates to America. He establishes himself in Philadelphia. He becomes a famous lawyer and judge. He commits himself to all sorts of Jewish causes and he loves Jewish books. And he becomes one of the main collectors. Some of the largest collectors of Jewish books for some reason were in Philadelphia in the 18 and 1900s. Don't ask me, but that's where they were. And he um, essentially then later in his life donates um, much of his collection to JTS. He also gives some of it to Dropsy College, which is in Philadelphia, and the collection at Dropsy winds up at the Katz Center, um, in, which is affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania. So we can basically now track the book all the way from Ikhar, who the people were, and each of these people really has some kind of personality or some kind of piece of historical evidence and helps us to fill out the narrative arc um, of Jewish history. Okay, so this brings us now um, to the end, or I shouldn't say to the end, to um, where we are today. Um, okay. And what it is that Lucy and I would like to see happen, um, or what is happening today. And what is happening today with Footprints is that we have people all over the globe who are in libraries, in their homes, um, working for footprints and loading in information so that we will have the largest record of copies of Jewish books in a database in the world. Um, and so that's what's going on with footprints today. Um, JTS is, is there sponsoring us along with Columbia University, Stony Brook University and the University of Pittsburgh. Um, but what I wanna do is I wanna turn this conversation over to Lucia who in dreaming with me several years ago in a JTS cafeteria, never thought that the dream would come true, that she would find the actual synagogue, believe that in fact, either next to or within the synagogue was the printing, printing press. And she's gonna share with you now some pictures um, of that synagogue, um, which you can visit now and, and, yes. and go for it. We're, we're going to visit it. Let's see if it works because we have a, a video so that you have more like a sense of, of, of how it looks like and how it is to be there. But the, the, the synagogue that pushed me to start this research might be the home of the outcomes of this research. This is why uh, we present it as uh, what's coming next, because now with the town council, we have a plan to recover the whole Jewish quarter, the synagogue, and also the, um, the like create a, a museum of a cultural center for the study of Hebrew printing and Hebrew books in this place. Um, I'll ask Marjorie if you could yeah, take the, my share share. the screen. And like this, let's see if it works because probably you get a better sense of um, of this uh, of this place if I show you a, a video that my colleague Jose Angel Guimera has prepared. So I will uh, tell you about 
these images as they move. So this is the synagogue when a Marjorie came before the restoration, uh, named the Church of San Antonio Abad. At the time, you can more or less guess that it was in bad condition. There were uh, some crutches inside, but be because of the colloquium, that we organized uh, and Marjorie was kind enough to come and help us bring awareness on the importance of this place. So there was some funding to consolidate the building, but the issue was that they were uh, considering restoration of the building, but as a church, because it's been as a church until now. Until 2017, we knew that there had been a synagogue there, we knew that the location of the medieval synagogue was there, but we didn't know if the church was the synagogue or just a modern church standing on the location of the synagogue. That's the idea. So uh, we uh, managed to um, force, I would say this would work, an archaeological excavation of the space. It was just a short one, uh, not very much indeed, but enough to show things such as the basis of a bima. It's an aerial view, so you might not see it but very well, but there was, a, it is a kind of podium located, be located, this be located like typical in Sephardic synagogues. Interestingly, you see here some tombs. Uh, that's of course from the Christian period when the place was used as a church. Here to the left, we see these stairs. These stairs are the actual entrance to the synagogue. Today we have an entrance that's modern, but that was the main entrance to the synagogue. With uh, the altar piece of San Antonio Abad, here you have it. The thing is that when the, the Jews were expelled from Spain, this place was given to the Franciscan order who established here uh, a church devoted to St. Anthony, which is a saint that's represented by a peak, a fork. I don't know if you see that here, but as offensive as it could be to the false Christians, to the remaining Calvin Jews, that uh, their synagogue was now devoted to this saint. And it has been like this for over 600 years. Now, this other piece is removed and you'll see in a minute what came out behind because it's very exciting. <laughs> so the, the place is not that big, it's around 150 square meters of, but it's, it's very beautiful. It's fully standing. These archeological excavations have uh, proven that all basic elements of a synagogue are there. It's the only one intact, almost intact, of course, and complete in all the region of Aragon. Now you see how it looks like today with the restoration and the main consolidation done and the arch of entrance to the Jewish quarter. And this is the jewel of the crown. As part of these excavations, when we removed the altarpiece of the saint behind it, they did some little testing uh, uh, excavations of the walls. And you can see paintings there in Grisalia, it's called in Spanish, like gray color that represent uh, from the saint or, or last supper or something. So our paintings from the Christian period, use of the church, but right below this or uh, behind these Christian paintings, you can notice that there is a menorah a menorah that is exactly as it is described, the menorah of the Mishkan in the Exodus. It's clearly a menorah, partial, but now we need to continue and leaving uh, these, 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 these paintings to see what's next. Behind the altarpiece, we found um, a nechal, very well decorated with Gothic foliage, as you see, it is typical of Gothic and Mudejar styles in the area. There are more, the, the rooftop is Moorish medieval rooftop intact, is the 15th century one. And on the right-hand side of the uh, Echal, 
there is a Hebrew inscription that still needs to you know, be completely uncovered, but clearly these are Hebrew letters and I believe it's uh, Tehli 106 email. There is a coincidence of these letters in the Psalms, which is common to have writings from the Psalms decorating these places. So now we can say we were right. This was <laughs> synagogue could not be um, forgotten, could not be just treated as one more Hermitage, as an Hermitage would not be that interesting, not even artistically, because it's not beautiful, let's say Catholic style, it's not spectacular, it's a synagogue, so it's just what we need for, um, for prayer there, and now it's been, as I said, consolidated, it's not at risk anymore, and now we are facing the challenge to give it a new use, a new use that is respectful, of course, of both the Jewish past and the Christian past, but please, the Jewish past too. So the idea is to recognize this uh, Jewish legacy of Iha and uh, to, to connect this place to Jewish culture back again. Now you see an aerial view of the town to get a taste of how small it is, because if you come from New York City or anywhere else in the US, this is a less than 2,000 uh, people uh, town, but I wanted to stop here because you see what I meant before. The Jewish quarter is this kind of triangle that you see on the left. So it's kind of put apart of the main uh, town. And um, well, I thought that showing you our Jewish quarter as it is today, as Marjorie put it, is a, it's like another milestone. It's the end of this presentation, but it's the beginning of all the work that we have to conduct now to do something of value um, in, in this town. Connected to this, oh, look at that, that's super curious. You see, in the entrance of the church, we have a bell, but as it was not originally built to be a church, there is not a bell tower. They just open a hole in the wall to put a bell. So all these little things and the personal intuition led me and some other colleagues of mine think that this was a synagogue and thankfully uh, now we have to do it, no? So now we wanna combine this material heritage of Ikar with the immaterial heritage of Ikar, which is all Alan Tansi's legacy, the books, the printing press, to create a narrative that can sustain a project for the future, that can be meaningful, that can transform the town and that can reconnect these people with their Jewish heritage because uh, that's a need and I think this is what we have to do um, now. Connected to, to this, there is another project on the uh, creating a documentary uh, to, to trace the, the steps of Elias Ben Alantansi. We have a teaser, but I'm not going to put it now because we're running out of time and it's time to, to open for, for questions, but we will put the link on the chat box or maybe or share it later so that you can watch it and see uh, the future of Alan Tansi's travels. Um, I, I just want to say too that um, Lucy is a real dreamer and she encourages me also. Um, and she really thought that if it hadn't been for the kind of work that she does daily, I don't think that Spain would have recognized Ikar with its synagogue and it would have just gone down in history as a church um, and we never would have known um, what we know. And so I just think it's fantastic that um, she's found something real and, and really something so important to our past. Um, and it makes me, it just gives me encouragement. But anyway, so we're gonna to turn to some questions. You've given me encouragement all the way long, and you know it. Um, so, Julia, yeah. um, I don't know, are you moderating questions? Yeah. I am. Um, so thank you so much. What a, what a journey you just took us on. Um, what an amazing set of images and, and um, such storytelling. So thank you so much. Um, 
So I, I have a bunch of questions and I just want to remind people if you want to ask questions of our two scholars, you can submit them to me, Rabbi Julia Andelman in the chat. Um, okay, so there were um, that's different categories of questions here. So I had a handful that were really about, about the, um, the printing specifically. Um, so I wanted to, I thought we could start with those. Um, so one question is, how do we know, what do we know about the, the text sources that the Yihar printers use to, you know, for their printed volumes? Um, so one thing we do know is they had manuscripts. Um, so beginning from the time in which the tour, for example, um, wrote, hand wrote the tour, you had scribes who produced manuscripts. Um, and so they had their hands on those manuscripts. And from those manuscripts, they put together, and don't forget, they could have had six different manuscripts, which they compared one to the other, which is why in all of these printing houses, you needed um, individuals very familiar with Jewish texts. Um, and then they printed what they thought was the best reading um, of the text, which is why at JTS, we train our graduate students always to look at manuscripts because in fact, you have one person's final decision. Um, we don't know 100% whether it was printed from one manuscript or from six. Um, the presumption that we have is it's probably there were many lying around. Um, so um, that's for that. For the Bible, it's much more complicated um, because of uh, Misora and various types of different um, Masoretic texts. And um, it's just, it's more complicated um, in terms of what they're drawing from. Okay, um, so here's related to what you were just saying. Here's a question from someone who uh, is familiar with the manuscript study that you were just just talking about. What we do here at JTS. So, um, this person is asking if there are common uh, typos in in books across Spain or Morocco or Turkey that might have um, or, or that are believed to have originated um, from from the common printing press um, in Ihar. Okay, so. I can't answer that. I am sure there are, <laughs> um, but um, I haven't come across one myself. I don't know if Lucia, you have, um, but that is one of the exciting things that we do is that if we can essentially see where the common mistakes are, or um, you know, we can essentially locate um, sometimes, um, you know, let's say a 20th century or 21st century printing of the tour, you can actually locate um, it in a particular space, you know, with a particular press based on the discrepancies, I should say. So it's kind of a cool science. Um, and, um, but I can't tell you, I know of one off the top of my head, but Lucia, did you want to add something? Tani, I think you have to um, unmute. What? Tani has to unmute. Now, now I am. Now I am. You Thank you, Tani. I have not come with uh, typos or mistaken mistakes that can be found in Turkey and in Ikhar, but I've come up with some typos and mistakes in the in the Ikhar in Gunagula that are GTS or the Yeshiva University, the one of ten, there are some. But what we can, I can say, if you want to know more about this connection, is that um, I didn't see, have the chance to see the, the books printed in Istanbul with Hebrew characters other than in photographic copies. But those who have seen the actual book say that they, the, 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 the face types show waste when they were printed. So it's maybe even the same types that came out of it because we could think that they did another set of types or similar set of types using the same matrices. But it seems that they are the actual same materials. That's, that's all I can say because I didn't see the Istanbul ones uh, with my own eyes. Um, great. And the last question related to printing was just uh, how um, how prolific was this press? And it's, I think you said it, this, it existed for six years. So we know how many books they printed and, and how many are still extant today. 
Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are 58 extant copies of uh, complete or partial of uh, Hebrew books printed in Iha. 58 in different libraries all around the world. Is the that just the tour though? That's just the tour, right? The tour, the the the, the Rachaim and the Yeridea, the Tuturim printed in Iha. There is a, a Hebrew Bible with the five Megillot and the Aftarot, a Pentateuch with Rashi comments, which is the one um, I, I show you with the border. But that's included in the 58? Sorry? That, is that included in the 58? Yes, yes, yes. So 58 of all oh, the titles. Okay. And then there is a fifth title printed in Ikhar, which, which are later prophets. There are two or three copies of that one. And I, I think also we believe that each time one book comes off a press, usually its run is about 300. So, um, you know, so you have to sort of think about how many then were lost along the way. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of loss. There is a, 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 a partial, uh, just some leaves of uh, Megillah Bester that seem to be printed with Ihar uh, characters, but as it's just a fragment and there are no publishing references like a colophon or so, we cannot be positive about it. It's found uh, folding an inquisitorial procedure against the uh, Jewish convert from Navarra in the 16th century. So some parts of these books were reused by the Inquisition to fold other materials. And eventually we find this, these excerpts. Um, all right, so uh, turning to a new topic, we had a lot of questions about, um, about other religions um, and about uh, the government. So let's turn to those. So there were a few questions about about censorship. Um, how how much was how much was um, censorship by Christian authorities happening, um, and 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 what was motivating it, or or alternatively, um, was there was it seen as a benefit to papal authorities to have to have this this press and and these books be available. Or maybe both. But there's no censorship in Ikhar. The censorship is in Italy. So just to so, so none of the none of the books from Ikhar were sent were censored. No, 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 not 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 and not at the time they were printed. That's the thing. When they yeah, were later. There is a possibility to print, but the censorship of Hebrew books normally is done by the Inquisition for those copies who will be used by uh, other inquisitors or by Christian Hebrews to learn Hebrew, or, you know, because they, they were not expected to read passages criticizing idolatry, for example, because they were being idolaters all the time. So it's for their own Christian book uh, use. If, if it's not for Christian use, they just burn the, the books and destroy them. So that was in Spain, though, right? That's in Spain after yeah. the Inquisition. But in but, Italy, where the Jewish community is active and living, they will censor the books, hoping to control what it is Jews can read. Um, and so, um, so that that's you know that's basically. I mean, if they see any um, citations that are negative against you know Christianity, they'll take that out. Um, they'll cross it out. Um, and then give the book back to the Jews. So this way they know exactly what Jews are reading, what they're studying, and they have complete control over, they think, what the Jews can think. Um, so it's a control authoritative type of mechanism. Got it, okay. Um, so, um, Okay, so so we heard from you that the that the regional government of Aragon has um, supported you in this project. I think you said, and um, someone was was um, saying, I guess from other knowledge, that 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 government has also recently included Holocaust studies as part of its public school curriculum. And the question is, do you have any sense why uh, why the regional government in Aragon specifically has become so interested in its own Jewish legacy and Jewish history in general, 
um, you know, kind of supporting the this literature and, and these narratives and, and, and history? Well, um, I think that both initiatives, ours, uh, the, there is another a third one, which is the creation of uh, an Aragon distribution network that it's been kind of running for two or three uh, years already. Um, most of these initiatives, honestly, uh, come from individuals who gave the proposal to the government of Aragon that thankfully have accepted them. So th there is this kind of openness uh, to more multicultural studies that's going on now. Uh, regarding the Holocaust uh, thing, well, I can't say, okay, thank God, because it's mandatory in the European Union to teach about the Holocaust. And despite this fact, it's not the case everywhere in Spain. So thankfully, the government of Aragon is putting uh, efforts on, on this, and it's, it's helping us uh, recently with, with the synagogue as well. But there are different departments, so it's, it's different departments of the government that are getting more and more sensitive to this topic. Thank you. Um, there's also a question about if, uh, if there was ever um, Muslim leadership in Ihar or, or in this region that I don't interacted, I guess, with these, um, with, with the press or with its legacy in any way. There was, but probably did not interact in terms of power ranges uh, with the printing press. Actually, I showed you in these images where the Jewish quarter is, but in Ikan you can see the Jewish quarter, the former Muslim quarter, and the former Christian quarter. The, the, the urbanism of the three cultures is very well like fossilized in today's stuff. Then, Ihar was conquered by the Muslims first, later by the Christians. So it was under Muslim rule until the 11th, 12th century, and the Jewish community establishes that later in coexistence with the Muslims. So Jews and Muslims were a minority under the Christian rule. What we know is that the Masons, the, the, the architects of the, yeah, the Masons, who actually built the synagogue are probably of Muslim origin because the type of architecture and the architectural style of the synagogue using brick, for example, is what we call in Spain, in Spain, Mudejar architecture, architecture, which is um, a style exclusive of the areas where Muslim uh, workers constructed buildings for Christian Jews. So if they were those building things at the town, when they needed to, uh, the Jewish community needed the synagogue, also Muslim, Muslims built the synagogue. And uh, regarding the architectural style, it seems out of any doubt that the synagogue was actually built by Muslims. It was built by them as a synagogue? Built as a synagogue for the Jewish community. It's just that they commissioned workers that, that were, because they were the Freemasons, I uh, Freemasons, the Masons, uh, so how do you say that, that the, the constructors. And most of the mm, prominent buildings in town, also the church was built by Muslims, the Catholic church in town was built by Muslims. It's just that they were they worked on this, the Jews did other stuff, the Christians did other stuff. This society was very sectorized. So interesting. Um, I just wanted to interject because a handful of people are asking what the tour was. I think they, they missed that definition. So we'll just remind everyone. So the tour was a massive um, legal compendium of its time in four sections and it, it, it's, its structure, um, the way it organized topics of halakha, of Jewish law, kind of determined everything for hundreds of years afterwards. So it's really kind of the most significant um, several volume legal work of its time. So that, that's what the tour is. Um, okay. Uh, so someone's asking um, if you could situate this, um, this the, the printing press in Ihar with, with other um, printing going on in the Jewish world. Sort of what, what, what else was happening at the time or was this ahead of its time? So um, this is the beginning of print, um, 1480. I mean, Gutenberg is about 1450. Um, so, uh, you know, this, 
this is kind of, you know, very early on in the history of print. Um, Gutenberg obviously is not in Spain, but, um, uh, but we're talking certainly everything printed before 1500, we call them incunabula. Um, and obviously there are printing presses that are non-Jewish printing presses across Europe, but the main um, production of incunabula is coming out of Spain before 1500. So I don't know if that, that helps. Uh, and then once the Jews uh, are expelled from Spain, then what you'll see is, is you'll see the development of printing presses in Lisbon, um, in Fez, in North Africa. Well, North Africa, maybe not so much, but certainly Italy becomes the then center of print um, in the 1600s. In the, in the 15, late 1500s, 1600s, Italy becomes a center. So it's a, it's, it's a long time between, um, between this early press and, and when, when printing becomes more common, it sounds like you're saying. Um, no. Should we something like that? True. No. Um, no, because we know that um, in Salonika, in the Ottoman Empire, when the Jews are expelled from Spain, early 1500s, um, Jews are printing books um, throughout the 1500s um, in Constantinople and in Salonika. So it's it's actually ongoing. Um, it's There's no break at all. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, okay, so now that now that we've redefined the tour for people, we're getting some more questions about the tour. Which um, so the question really is, um, um, I, I think it's I think it's why the tour really? Why was why is why was that the focus? I mean, the the person was asking um, if you could say more about you know where where it was originally assembled and written and when. Uh, but my my the question that I'm adding to that is um, how did how did this become um, such a focus in the car? Um, Lucia, do you want me to answer? Mm -hmm. um, so, so basically what, what I'd like for everyone to understand is, is that obviously the Talmud is an earlier work to the tour and somewhere in the 1000, 1100 time period, Jews start to be interested in producing legal code material where they compile um, the legal material by theme or by topic. Um, and so eventually um, the tour becomes a primary um, following Maimonides um, to produce material that is topically arranged. And that topical arrangement um, makes it easier for people to access the law. Whereas if you open up a Talmud, it's not so easy to just access and know exactly what to do, let's say on Shabbat. Um, but if you have a section that um, basically was apparent in the tour on Shabbat, you would be able to study Shabbat law. Um, and Jews supposedly um, in Spain, for whatever reason, were spending a lot of time in um, um, houses of study, studying code material. They were studying the tour. Um, and it was so much so that they felt that the Talmud was almost being lost as a, as a central book of study, um, which then led individuals such as a Jacob Ibn Khaviv in 1515 to produce what we call the Ein Yaakov, which was a collection of Talmudic Agadah because he was upset that everyone was studying the codes and they were missing out on all the non-legal material that appeared in the Talmud. So, you have to imagine that the legal material is really driving a lot of the of the um, study um, of Jews who are interested in living their everyday lives according to Jewish law. Um, so, the, so it's really the focus on the tour is really it's it's um, it's consistent with what, what the focus of um, the orientation of Jewish life at the time you're saying. Correct, and the reason why Orachaim and Yaradea, which are the two um, um, sections of the tour that are published in Ichar is because those are the two sections that deal with Shabbat, Chag, Kashrut, you know, so it's like the, you know, the bread and butter of, of everyday life. Um, so that makes sense um, to publish that. There are some volumes of the Talmud that are printed, but a full um, set of the Talmud isn't printed until 1522. So the tour is kind of, you know, sort of earlier. There's earlier, there's there's more interest in publishing more copies of it earlier than there's interest in publishing the Talmud. 
Great, thank you. Um, Lucia, a few people have asked about your family history, and I don't know if you're interested in talking about that, but um, you know, someone was wondering if you can trace your own lineage back to this time, or were there converses in your, in your ancestry, those kinds of questions. Okay, thanks for the question, and I'm happy to answer. I don't know, but I think so. The idea is that I, I have always uh, suspected since I became interested in, in, in Jewishness, let's say, that uh, probably I come from a family of converted uh, Jews because of my family names. My name is Lucia Conte Aguilar. Aguilar is a very common name among new Christians in Spain, for example, and also the family names of my grandparents. But of course, that's not a proof enough of having had a Jewish lineage. Um, I cannot do um, direct you know, research of my own roots to, to check whether I had a Jewish ancestry for sure, because the baptism records uh, of Ihar were burned during the Spanish Civil War. So I cannot go further than my grand grandfathers because there is memory about them. Uh, but, but probably I could do this. A lot of people in Spain tracing back their Jewish roots and, and doing even DNA tests and things like this. Uh, but to, to the best of my knowledge, I probably am of Jewish origin as 70% of the Spanish population, by the way, because those who had to convert mix with other Christian families, and it is very common in Spain to have a Jewish ancestry. So when I made my decision to go back to um, Judaism, I, I did not do a return as others uh, do, because I cannot prove it, but I did a conversion. But probably a return would have been enough. But, but I also think, Lucia, you once told me that you observed in your household that your mom she didn't put the yeah. meat together with the milk or she would only cook separate I had, I had some, well, when you start the studying and learning about Judaism in this case, then you recognize things that you didn't know that could be of Jewish origin. And um, in my family, I haven't seen people lighting candles on Shabbat. I've met a lot of people in Spain reporting these stories personally, but it's not my case. But yes, I realized, for example, that in my house, uh, milk was always separated than, uh, than from, uh, from, uh, from meat. And, and once I used, uh, in the, when I, I was a teenager, and I just wanted to heat some meatballs in a pot that my mom used to, 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 to heat the milk. And I, she, she started like to shout at me, like saying that I was crazy, what are you doing? And I didn't understand why did she say that? And, and she just said, we don't do that. And, and she doesn't know anything about this. And, and why did my, she, she doesn't do it, but she said that my grandmother never did it, my grand-grandmother, you know, these little stories, yeah, there are plenty. Thank you. Um, so we just have one minute left, but we will, we'll squeeze in a final question. Um, so one person was asking if um, th they were imagining going on tour, actually, with the two of you um, on a tour to, to the Iberian Peninsula, and then sort of wondering um, how much how much active Jewish culture is there today, or, or is it really, would a Jewish tour um, of that area really be, be mostly about the books? If, if you mean in the Aragonese area, Jewish life as uh, living Jewish communities and, and real Jewish life, there is no one. There is uh, some people uh, teaching Hebrew and doing some cultural activities to bring awareness about Jewish life in, who live in, in Zaragoza, which is the main city in the area. And uh, she's from Israel and she started an association to, to, to do this. But there is not a Jewish community in all the region of Aragon, to the best of my knowledge. There is an interest in Jewish culture, uh, but uh, there are projects like mine in Ihar that might arise in other towns. But there is not a Jewish community there yet. But the, I will say, having been to Ihar, that it's definitely worth the trip. 
it is fascinating because of you can see the past come alive. And that's that's what matters. Um, but I think that if there are Jewish communities that are developing in Spain, they're in Madrid, they're in Barcelona, they're in, in major cities, just like here in America, where we tend to gravitate to the larger cities. Um, Ikar is a very small, um, no offense to Lucia, small, but um, definitely worth seeing those Hebrew letters on the synagogue walls. <laughs> It's, it's worth it. You are the only ones, uh, world, medieval wall paintings with Hebrew inscriptions in all Spain. So just for that, it's worth the trip. But um, yeah, and, and, and this is why we want to do something about this heritage to bring it to life. And this is why it's important that it's done with authenticity, respect, and sensitivity, because there is no contact, generally in Spain, in most places, there's no direct contact with Jewish culture. So even with the best of intentions, one can do important mistakes. Uh, and, and, and I've seen that in my professional life. No? With the best of intentions, you restore a place or you create an interpretation center that's anecdotic, that can be even almost offensive sometimes, uh, just because they don't know. Right, right. That's why it's important yeah. that these projects are done with a certain sensitivity and with the participation of Jewish communities in Spain or in other areas, even if it's not in the town itself, because that in Spain is almost impossible that in a town there is a Jewish community. Mm -hmm. Now we are working, for example, with the Foundation of Jewish Heritage in Europe, uh, who are kind of uh, guiding us through this process, uh, because uh, otherwise it's difficult. It's, it's sort of a, it's kind of a sober note to end on, but I think um, absolutely, as you said, it, it just, it just highlights all the more um, how important these projects are, um, these, the types of projects that you're doing. And, and really, it's, as you said, to, to really approach it as a scholar, because that, that's the, that's the closest we're going to get to, to this history is, is, you know, examining it really um, with, with the right tools and the right knowledge. Um, and, and as you said, Marjorie, bringing, bringing our history to life in this way. So thank you so much for sharing this with us today. Really um, just, just so fascinating and full of, full of positive comments in the, in the chat. It was, it was wonderful to have both of you. So really thank you so much um, and for sharing your personal story as well. Um, I hope uh, many of you will join us again next week where we will zoom forward um, hundreds of years um, our, our session next week is the global, journey, the global Journey of a Jewish Stage Play, The Spectacular Story of the Dybbuk and How It Transformed American Jewish Theater. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Dybbuk and, and it has a whole history that, um, that you may or may not know of. So Dr. Edna Nachshon will be teaching us next week. So hope to see you then. And thank you once again to our scholars today and thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.